This podcast is sponsored by Echelon. Echelon is the affordable way to get the workout equipment, the workout community, and an instructor's motivation right in the comfort of your own home. With Echelon, you can work at any time, day or night, and crush your fitness goals. And right now, for a limited time, podcast listeners get up to $800 off MSRP. To get this exclusive podcast discount, text GENIUS to 818181 to get up to $800 off MSRP. Once again, just text GENIUS to 818181. Quick disclaimer, message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Dr. Alicia Carter, She's a lecturer in evolutionary anthropology at University College of London. We're going to talk about primates, her research with them. So, Alicia, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what got you interested in working with uh, primates and how long have you been doing it? Oh, my goodness. What a good question to start with. Um, I actually had no way of working with primates. I'm Australian, actually, and we have no primates in Australia. And although I've always been interested in them, it seemed to me that coming from Australia, there weren't very few opportunities um, to get to work with primates, despite the fact that they're super interesting. We didn't learn about them at all during my degree. And I just by chance, I was volunteering in Africa, helping somebody else with their research program. So in Namibia, where I currently do most of my research. And I just happened to bump into one of the, co- well, who is now one of the co-directors of the Taubus Baboon Project. And we got chatting about his research and his field site. And I told him what I was interested in doing for my PhD. At the time, I had funding and an idea, but no study species or study site. And that's basically how I ended up working with primates. We started chatting about my ideas, which was to work on animal personality. And he suggested that he could host the project at his site. And that was back in 2008. And I've been working with Talbot's Baboon Project ever since. Oh, very cool. I was going to joke that when you flew from Australia to London, you skipped over Africa. You had to <laughs> yes. go back so you could study Indeed. what you wanted. Absolutely. So, okay, you spent a lot of time in Namibia. You literally spent a lot of time in the field with various, uh, what, chimpanzees or orangutans? No, or- yeah, good question. Sorry for not. I have done all of my primate work with baboons, actually. So I've, I've studied a bunch of other species as well. I'm a classically trained as a zoologist. So my first research project was on mosquito fish, which is an invasive fish species in Australia. I then did some work on kangaroos and, and lizards. But all of my primate work has been on medium-sized to large-sized uh, monkey that tends to get around on the ground. Um, a lot of the time it's very terrestrial, which makes it quite easy to study. They also hang out in really large groups with about 50 to 80 individuals in them, which also makes them a really great study species. Um, so they're, they're big, charismatic, easy to see, easy to follow. And there are lots of them, which makes them one of the best and easiest primates to work with. I don't know if it's a danger if you're around 50 to 80 of them, and something <laughs> yeah. goes wrong. Like, I don't know. It seems like they could stampede or attack and you'd be finished pretty quick you know yeah. So one of my close colleagues is a, he studies um, chimpanzees and we've had lots of conversations about whether chimpanzees or baboons are scarier. So I think chimpanzees are scarier because they're much larger, much stronger, a lot more, I guess, strategic in the way that they use violence and aggression. But the baboons do have massive canines, like these huge like swords and knives, I guess you could call them in their mouths. And they tend to form big coalitions against each other. So we had some scary moments at the field site where there's been a misunderstanding and the baboons have formed a coalition and threatened us. But for the most part, they're relatively laid back about our presence. It takes anywhere from three months to a year to habituate a troop. And by habituate, I mean, we get the individuals in the group used to having us around so that they treat us as as just another animal in their environment. So one that they're not afraid of. And at the moment, the troops that we study, they've been habituated for over 15 years, both troops. And so they're just so used to having us around. They go about their 
stay as they would as if uh, we weren't there, or we assume that's the case. And they seem relatively unperturbed by the fact that we're around. Sometimes they're a little bit curious. So during the siesta time, we often have juveniles or infants come to stare at us because they're interested. But for the most part, they just tend to ignore us. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so they ignore you completely or do they try to interact with you? For the most part, they they tend to ignore us. I mean, they monitor us. They keep an eye on where we are. Like it's it's not it's not as if we don't exist. We do, uh, but they don't react to us. Like they don't move away if we're in the vicinity, and they're they're quite happy to to do normal behaviors. Um, some of them are, are a little bit more curious. Certainly, the juvenile more interested in us. It seems to be as soon as they turn adult and they've got grown up things to do that we're no longer as interesting um, as when they've got a lot of spare time on their hands when they're little. Yeah, I mean that for the most part they're not they're not paying much attention to us except for those occasions when they're bored and they've got nothing else to do. Are there populations that you deliberately interact with or most of them you deliberately don't so that you preserve the, the natural behavior? So yeah, there are a lot of different ways to answer that question. So across Africa, there are more than 20 long-term field studies of baboons that have been going on for anything from a couple of years to one project that's been going on for 60 or 70 years now. And we tend to, as behavioral ecologists, as people who are interested in why animals behave in the ways they do, we tend to follow the same individuals through long periods of time. We have these two habituated troops that I've been studying for a couple of decades now at our field site. And there are other field sites that have anywhere from one to six or more groups that they've been studying for long periods of time. And that the reason that we focus on particular groups and not others is to get those long-term data. So baboons are a, a long-lived primate at our population where predation pressure is low because it's a desert. <laughs> they can live anywhere between 15 and 25 years. And to get an idea of really what's going on within a lifetime of an individual, you need long-term data. So we keep going back to the same groups over and over and over again to find out what happens throughout their entire lives. Um, of course, there are many, many, many groups of baboons throughout the rest of Africa that aren't studied in this way. And there are, of course, other field projects that will go in for short periods of time and not collect data in this um, longitudinal way. But for the most part, people who study baboons tend to have this longitudinal life history, um, individual-based approach. So what are some of the interesting things? I'm sure you've observed billions of things, but what are, what are some <laughs> of the stuff that, uh, that really amazed you? I guess the, the thing that I'm most fascinated at the moment is with dead infant carrying in the baboons. So it's happened a couple of times at our field site. We have about 14 or 15 records of it. It's incredibly sad and heartbreaking when it happens. So if a female, if her infant dies, sometimes she'll carry the corpse with her. It's not always the case that they individuals will carry their infants' corpses, but um, very frequently they do for anything up to, at our site, for 14 days. But at other sites, it can be much longer, many, many weeks to months. Um, so that I've observed that a couple of times in the field. And then in 2017, I observed not only a mother carrying a corpse, but there was a, an occasion when the mother died before the infant died. So the mother died, but her infant was still dependent on her, still nursing, and that infant died a couple of days later. And it was really shocking and fascinating and sad and extraordinary to see both the individuals interacting with that infant when she was alive when she didn't have her mother but also what they did when she had when she had died they carried her corpse around so other individual members of the troop also carried her corpse around for about a day which was just not at all what I would have predicted. So that actually that one observation has spurred on an entire research program that I'm trying to follow up on now to try and understand that behavior. But of course, there are many, many wonderful memories of being with the baboons and then doing something that's been utterly surprising, like swimming underwater, for example, which I never thought that they would do, but seem to love. <laughs> Do you ever uh, hang out with your kids and think, man, we do the same thing as these baboons? Oh my gosh, my one-year-old is basically a baby baboon. She just doesn't have a tail. <laughs> she, they do exactly the same behaviors, the same kinds of, yeah, the same kinds of uh, oral exploration of objects, the same kind of attention getting behaviors. They're, I, it's fascinating, actually, having a child now after having spent a decade watching baboon mothers raise their infants. Well, that's cool. Yeah, my wife says her youngest. She called her a monkey child when she was little. <laughs> she would hang on her all the time, you know? So, oh, yeah, I'm crazy. sure it's yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I'm a bit, well, this is an, another research field that I'd like to get into. But uh, we like the the Western approach to, to child rearing, where we put our babies down on their backs in a crib with nothing around them seems um, so very odd for a primate to do. It's no wonder that we struggle to get babies to sleep on their own on their backs. And so this the idea of like, I think they call it the kangaroo, like to, the kangaroo wearing or something like that, where you've got your baby on you all of the time is a much more primate friendly approach, something our infants are much more used to being or expecting when they come out of the womb. I've been working too hard and not working out enough. I wanted to get in shape, but I don't have time to get to the gym. Echelon brings the gym home to me. So right now for a limited time, podcast listeners get up to $800 off MSRP. To get this exclusive podcast discount, text GENIUS, G-E-N-I-U-S, to 818181 to get up to $800 off MSRP. Once again, text GENIUS to 818181, and message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. Yeah, my wife is originally from Zimbabwe, and she literally did some of that stuff when uh, when our kids were very little. She would have them in a sling sometimes and you know, yeah. with her, and uh, it, it was pretty cool. I guess yeah. She <laughs> Home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I did the same with both of my girls. They they refused to be put down and um, I was actually quite fine with that. It's nice. It, there's a, a bunch of evidence showing that it's actually healthier for your baby and the mother uh, to have that kind of close contact, um, which is really nice. So your wife was onto mm. the, the right style, parenting style. <laughs> right on. Well, tell me what some of the interesting things you've learned from watching the primates. Um, my research has been quite varied since I started. So at the beginning, I was mostly interested in how their personalities would affect how they got around in the environment. So my earliest research was looking at whether bolder individuals were, for example, more successful at foraging than shyer individuals. And what I found was that they bolder individuals processed information differently to shyer individuals. So I assayed their personality by giving them novel foods and then seeing whether they wanted to eat it or not. And for those individuals who were happy to at least taste the food or eat the food that I had provided, I marked those ones as bold. And when they're getting around normally, then it's it's not a problem. Like it, all of the baboons know what there is to eat. It's just when you um, create a situation where they aren't sure of what's going on um, that their personality really comes out. So in that case, the shyer individuals were more likely to pay attention to what other individuals were doing and copy what they were doing. And the bolder individuals were more likely to just make it up as they went along. There was a lot of, we call this um, social information transmission or social learning, just paying attention to what others are doing and copying that behavior. Uh, and that in the baboon system was personality dependent. So basically, I spent my entire PhD trying to <laughs> trying to figure that out. Um, and it wasn't until after my PhD that I'd done all of the legwork during my PhD that I could actually come like finally get to that point where I could answer that question. Since that point, I've been interested in how more and in how information transmits through groups, not from um, one individual to another, but from one individual to another to another to another. So that information spread um, throughout the group. And I was particularly interested in how the social network that the baboons have might affect um, transmission within the groups. And you can measure social networks in a bunch of different ways. And at the, our field site, we usually focus on two. So one is looking at how frequently individuals are next to each other or within close proximity of each other. And it, it doesn't seem like it should be very indicative of anything, but actually baboons are quite aggressive creatures. So if they're letting another individual within, for example, five meters of them, then they probably have a, a good understanding or a good social bond underlying that. And then the other way is the classic, like classic primate behavior. So grooming. At our field site, we have long-term records on who's next to whom and who grooms whom. And we use those two basic networks to try and predict how information is transmitted through the groups. So my most recent research has uh, has shown that some networks are better at predicting information flow than others, and that some overall network characteristics are also better at predicting speedy transmission compared to not as speedy transmission. What behaviors seem to be closest to human behaviors and which ones seem to be the most alien? <laughs> Funny. It's, I haven't, I, it's a really good question, a good way to, to put it. I will tell you one anecdote. When I first got to the field, like I said, I'm Australian and my, we have no primates. I wasn't used to primates at all. And I agreed to do this PhD on the baboons when, well, before I had even spent any time with primates at all, I just knew that they had the right 
kinds of characteristics for the study species that I wanted to do this personality study in. And I was absolutely shocked when I got to the field that they are so human-like. They have the same kind of expressive faces. They rely a lot on facial expressions or facial gestures to, to communicate with one another. They seem to, like we do, understand what others are doing and why they're doing it. So what we would call a theory of mind, whether they have like a full-blown theory of mind, whether they're just used to seeing individuals act in a particular way. Yeah, that's still up for debate. But I was still completely shocked to see them, for example, tricking another, another individual or pretending that they hadn't seen something that they wanted to get because a dominant individual was nearby. So all of these things were a complete shock to me, completely out of my realms of experience of, of working with marsupials in Australia. Why not assume that people can do what if you start with that assumption, then what do you, you think? Yeah. So there are two fields of, fields of research. I don't think I went in with any assumptions. I just went in with what I had experienced, but that, which wasn't primates. <laughs> so I wasn't, I don't know what I was expecting when I got there. I was just shocked at how human like they were compared to other animals that I had been around. But it is a good position to start with that, that we might a priori predict that because of our close evolutionary history with primates behavior should be more like ours and there are two schools of thought in the yeah in the cognition side of behavior that either give what we would call a stingy interpretation to behavior or generous in, uh, interpretation to behavior and the argument for the generous one is is exactly that because we have this shared ev evolutionary history then it's probable that the same underlying mechanisms that we have for what causes our behavior is also causing what we observe in primates so that is one approach the the stingy interpretation is also called this behaviorist interpretation where an individual's behavior is determined by its previous experience so what we might interpret behavior as being quite complicated because that what we understand goes on in our own um, species from our own personal experience but that doesn't necessarily have to be happening in the minds of of the primates that are, or whatever animal it is, that's performing these, what looks like complex behaviors. And it, it's just a stalemate, not a very good way around. Like there are some really neat experiments, clever experiments out there in the cognitive lit literature that try to get at this question, but um, most of them can be interpreted either way with this either stingy or generous interpretation. You still have lots of people that just think baboons are what, just big robots. I think we're moving away from that, but it wasn't that long ago that was more accepted as a, an interpretation of behavior. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I think now we're definitely moving away from that. I guess with the, the more recent um, experiments that have been done and there's a, a bit of what's called the animal turn, I guess, um, where we're focusing a lot more on these more generous interpretations, which is nice. So Franz Duval is one of the... I don't know if you've read, if you're familiar with his work or if you've read any of his books there. Um, they're no, very generous. No, they're really fascinating if you, any of your listeners or you want a very nice, easy to access introduction to, I was going to say empathy. Lots of his work is on empathy, but it's basically on cognition in primates and what we can learn about our origins by understanding primate um, behavior. I mean, where do you fall in this debate? You've been hanging out with them for what, 13, 14 years. You know? <laughs> yeah. Are you firmly on one side or the other, or how do you feel? I'm far more on the generous side than not, I guess. But at the same time, they still do things that confuse me a lot of the time. And some of them, so for example, I remember, like I could totally explain this behavior in a, in a different way, but I have seen individuals who, for example, wanted to gather their infant who was on the other side of a fence but didn't understand that the infant was larger than its arm. So it was this female was reaching through the fence and trying to pull her infant through the fence. Or for example, if they're trying to walk through a fence, the female won't move her body so that her infant is out of the way. So if, the, if her infant is sitting on her back, she won't duck lower because her infant is on her back, for example. And that, that doesn't necessarily, sh we as humans wouldn't do that. We would have the perspective that our infant is in a different spatial position to, our, to us and we have to move our body to get our infant through this narrow aperture, for example. So there are things like that that are a bit surprising, but other behaviors that for me are quite indicative. Once you know baboons quite well, they're quite indicative of them having some kind of theory of mind or understanding what others are thinking and trying to manipulate that. Are baboons very self-aware? 
and aware of others? I would think they would have to be at all times, but are there times where they're not? Or I don't know, how would you explain this? Why they don't change change their body position when going through a fence, do you mean? Yeah, or... is it because they're not self-aware? Is it because they're really yeah. tough on their kids and they're like, just <laughs> suck it up and take it? Like, what, what do you think is the reason? I think for that one, it's because they're not aware they don't have the ability to put themselves in their infant's shoes at that point in time. There are some really, but again, it's the evidence that we have is really conflicting. And I, I find it very difficult to come down on one particular side. And I also think that there's a, a bit of individual variation amongst the baboons. And I'm sure that's the same for a lot of primates. So there are, there are a couple of answers to your question, but I will tell you one of the, I don't know, really, really influential people in the field of primate cognition and animal cognition generally is this um, pair of researchers um, who were at Penn, who um, Cheney and Safar, and they they give an anecdote of a female. So they studied um, baboons who were in the Okavango Delta, and they would frequently have to do uh, water crossings. And one of the females actually drowned her infant because she walked through water that was deeper than her belly. And her, at the infant that she had at the time was so small that it was clinging to her belly. And she just was not aware that the infant couldn't breathe if it was underwater. Now, whether that tells you that she can't take that infant's perspective and that it couldn't breathe or whether she understands that you have to have your head above water to be able to breathe a lot of ways that you could get at that observation but it does let you it does give you some support for what I the anecdote that I gave you that they seem to be unable to put themselves in others shoes in some circumstances so those are physical ones and there are I think different types of self-awareness so one is spatial self-awareness so like knowing where you are in space and it might be that baboons are just not selected to put themselves in another's shoes in terms of where they are in space. And that, that well, would make what, sense. What variation do you see in parenting in general? I mean, oh, the, in, you know, in humans is good and bad parents, but what about the baboons? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of variation there too. Actually, all primates um, vary. And there's a huge literature on, on mater- what's called maternal styles. And we're really interested in that the project at the moment, actually. So there are two different axes of behavior that mothers vary in across like the anthropoid primates, like what the monkeys that we're familiar with and great apes. And at least in the macaques and the baboons, these two uncorrelated axes in rejection. So there are highly rejecting mothers. So ones that keep babies at arm's length. Oh, I always forget the other one. There's rejection and it sounds like it matches. It'll come to me. But in any case, there are different types of, of mothers Um, that are more or less successful at at raising young that you can quantify quite accurately based on whether they collect their infant if it walks away from them or whether they allow their infant to nurse whenever it wants to nurse or if they reject it from from nursing Uh, there's a lot of variation actually okay so (laughs) what are are some of your current what what are some of your current hypotheses that you're working on my research falls into i guess two or three bigger questions at the moment so the one that I'm most excited about is trying to understand what primates generally and the baboons in particular understand about death. That falls into two research questions, I, I guess. They're, they're interrelated. But one is the cognitive side. So what do they understand about the state of being dead? And do they, do they have the same kinds of concepts that we have for death? For example, that death is irreversible, like thing, dead things can't come back to life and that dead things are non-functional, do they have that kind of understanding? Um, And then the other is the emotional response. Along with the cognitive, there's the emotional processing of of the loss of an individual. So if they do have an understanding of death, how do they process that at an emotional level? Do they grieve, for example? So my two, the majority of the research that I'm trying to get off the ground at the moment has to do with those two questions at the baboon site. I'm also interested in still following up on social networks and how information transmits through social networks and whether having different actors in different positions in the network um, can speed up or impede information flow through networks. And this is important for understanding um, not only primate culture, but also um, processes in humans. So if you always hang out with similar people to you, does that mean as we observe in humans that information gets stuck in these echo chambers and can't get out? There's not good information sharing. And then the third one is this, the, the question of maternal styles. So we have together with my collaborator, Elise, who's at Montpellier in France, we're trying to understand how 
different maternal styles impact the offspring. So what happens to those children when they grow up? If they've had a very rejecting mother, are they going to be fitter as adults or not? But that one is a very long term. We're just at the beginning of it. We need lots of infants. Well, what, well, what do you see? Is, is parenting style passed out? Oh, that's lines? a good question. We don't have the data for that now. I think that there is some evidence in macaques that that is the case. And there's some evidence in macaques that it's also socially learned. So back in early 80s, when they separated mothers and infants, the infants who hadn't experienced being raised by macaque mother had to learn by watching other macaque mothers how to be a macaque mother. So it does seem to be that there is some social learning of through both through personal experience of being parented by a particular parent but also through watching other individuals parent um, that primates learn how to be a parent which is pretty cool yeah, well, it sounds similar to people again yeah exactly and mothers tend to be consistent so if they're rejecting with one infant they're rejecting with another infant as well which is a bit of a shame what's the future of your research look like what are some big things that are coming or things that you uh, you know the studies that you're in the middle of you're looking for the data you're excited about Oh, such a good question. Um, I've had a couple of students out at the project at the moment who have installed a touchscreen and we're trying to do ex cognition experiments in the wild using a touchscreen computer. So that one I'm super excited about because it's been years in the making and we finally have something working in the field that the baboons can use and not destroy uh, that we can test their cognitive abilities on. So at the moment, we've just got a proof of concept. So we know that they'll use the touchscreen. So we're hoping that in the coming um, year or two, we'll have some proper cognition experiments going on with these touch screens in the wild. Um, so that's one of them. And the others, I've got other students who are working on this, this bigger death project, looking at how individuals are responding to objects with particular characteristics to see what it is that individuals are carrying corpses for. Like, is it because they have a bond with the individual or is it because these corpses have these infantile mammalian-like um, cues that they're attracted to because they're a primate. And I've got another long-term project on self-awareness with philosopher. And I've just had a student who's gone out and tried to successfully tried to do the mark test in the wild with the baboons. That one's just finishing up at the moment to so watch this space. <laughs> we'll, we're just in the process of finalizing the analyses for that one. Oh, what does that mean? I mean, these are just names of experiments, but what are you looking for in these experiments? In the mark test, we're looking for classic self-awareness. So the first evidence for self-awareness in primates was done, well, the experiment was done by this guy called Gallup, who put, he anesthetized some chimpanzees, put mark on their faces. So I think he, like something like face paint on their faces. And then when they woke up, he gave, put them in front of a mirror. And some of the individuals, they were chimpanzees who did this, would touch the mark on their face. So it seemed like it says there's good evidence of them being aware that the individual in the mirror is themselves. Um, so they're self-aware. Mark test has been done by lots of different researchers and lots of different species. And it's, it's not nearly as clear cut as great apes have self-awareness and non-great apes don't. There's a lot of variation like within chimpanzees, for example, and very little evidence that, for example, gorillas have this kind of self-awareness. But it's always been done in captivity. So this is the first time that we've gone out to the wild to try and at least prove that you can do this kind of test. So instead of using a mark because we didn't want to capture the individuals and paint them, we put it used a laser pointer instead, not one that obviously hurts them, but enough of one to to put a point on their faces when they were looking in a mirror what did they do then what happened nothing they did nothing <laughs> so they are very interested in the mark when they can see it on there without the mirror but then they don't respond to it in the mirror and this is totally consistent with with experiments that we know that have been done in macaques for example so macaques without being trained are unaware that the individual in the mirror is themselves we have found more support for that hypothesis, but at least we've done it in the wild now. Well, where can people go to find out more about your work and maybe see, you know, pictures or movies that you've made? What's the best place? Um, I have a website. It's um, dralesiacarter.strikingly.com. So if you just search for Dr. Alicia Carter, you'll come across my website. I think it's one of the top hits. I'm also on Twitter with the handle at Alicia underscore Carter. And I do post to Twitter occasionally. I'm very bad at social media, though. Um, but I do put my research out there because I tend to be quite excited about um, telling people about what I found out. So those are the two best places to keep up with my research.
Okay. Well, very good. Well, Alicia, it's been good talking to you. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's just a very interesting subject. Last question. Have you ever been able to meet or hang out with Jane Goodall? I know she did with uh. different primates <laughs> than you, but is she I someone have... in, the, in the field that still is good to know? Oh, she's amazing. I, she's such an inspiration. Yes, I have met her, but only very, very briefly. And I was probably one of those hundreds of uh, people that came up to her and was like, you're, you're the person who made me go into this career. <laughs> her and David uh, Attenborough. <laughs> no, but I, yeah, that's the extent that I've had with, with Jane Goodall, unfortunately. Well, Alicia, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much for the interesting questions, Richard. And I, yeah, um, looking forward to hearing more of your podcast in the future. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast, which has been sponsored by Echelon. When you're trying to reach your fitness goals, it can really help to have world-class instructors like Nicole Griffin and Michael Brown choreographing classes with music from your favorite artists like Pitbull. And you get a community of hundreds of thousands of people who can give you that extra push. Echelon gives you that. Echelon's certified fitness instructors are supportive, engaging, and fun. They really know how to get you moving. And right now for a limited time, Podcast listeners can get up to $800 off MSRP. To get this exclusive podcast discount, text GENIUS to 818181 to get $800 off MSRP. Once again, text GENIUS to 818181. Message and data rates may apply. Please see terms for details. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.